One of our biggest flaws, collectively as people, is our tendency to underestimate the power we have on others without even giving a second thought. We make choices that produce dire consequences that we never even anticipated. And with the internet giving us access to more information than we ever thought was possible, we must now be more mindful of this than ever before. And on October 4th, 2005, a bored teenager would unknowingly change online history. On that day, over 1 million people across MySpace logged onto their accounts and discovered that their profiles had been hijacked, but not in the way that you think. They hadn't been hacked and their passwords were still safe, yet somehow their web pages had been visibly changed. Nearly everybody on the platform was now suddenly friends with a mysterious user named Sammy, with text even appearing on their pages, which declared, Sammy is my hero. Not too long after, Sammy's profile just disappeared. And then a little after that, so did all of MySpace. The world's most popular social network was now gone, leaving millions of people around the world completely puzzled as to what just happened. In just under 24 hours, Sammy, also known as the Space Hero Worm, had become the fastest growing computer virus of all time. So what exactly happened? Given that the payload of this worm was pretty much harmless, you may think that its impact on everyday traffic across the web would be more or less benign, but that's actually not true. Although its capabilities make it seem quite silly, the Sammy Worm's effects on the internet are still with us today. They not only serve as a lesson in how we should be more mindful of patching big security vulnerabilities, but they also serve as a reminder for just how much influence the everyday person has, even when making seemingly trivial decisions. This is the story of Sammy and the kid who accidentally stole MySpace. Speaking of MySpace, I also need MySpace to play some War Thunder, which happens to be today's sponsor. Do you pop out at parties? Are you unpopular? Well, I can't help with that. That's something you should probably discuss with your therapist, but War Thunder will help you not think about it as much. It is the world's most comprehensive vehicle combat game and features over 2,000 planes, tanks, ships, and helicopters which you can use in dynamic combine arms PvP battles. War Thunder really makes the gaming experience immersive by making every vehicle incredibly detailed and accurately modeled down to each of their components. And it's available on PC, Xbox Series X and S, and PS5 and before. Now we've all had those days where we're just constantly working and getting told what to do. Hey Nation Squid, you don't upload enough. Also, I'm cheating on you. Nothing beats relaxing after a stressful day like a game of War Thunder. It is the perfect game for all kinds of history lovers, using a collection of vehicles that span over 100 years of development and date as far back as the 1920s. You can see all these vehicles in crisp 4K resolution. Now this is something I really love about the game. There are just so many different options to choose from, and it really shows how much technology has evolved. It's quite educational in that way. And now you can try out War Thunder for yourself. By using my link shown in the description, you can get access to a large free bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, boosters, a premium account, and much more. At least on the planes in War Thunder, you don't have a baby crying in the seat next to you. Wait, did, did you really write that? That's stupid. Wait, what? It was funny. Anyway, go check out War Thunder and play among your friends. The story of the Sammy virus begins with our namesake and beloved MySpace friend, Sammy Kamkar. Even at his young age, Sammy was quite the gifted programmer. When he was 10 years old, he received his very first computer and logged on to the World Wide Web for the very first time. And the very first thing he did? Well, started searching online for the X-Files. He even found himself in a chat room asking, hey, who wants to talk about the X-Files? The only response he got was, get out. When he refused, another response followed, you have 10 seconds to get out. Lo and behold, 10 seconds later, Sammy's brand new computer was faced with a blue screen of death. But rather than getting angry, Sammy was just fascinated. Somebody on the other side of the world was able to gain full control of his computer without his permission. He wanted to do the same thing. 
Sammy had soon learned that this person used a program called WinNuke95, which exploited a vulnerability found in Windows that allowed people to effectively crash anyone's computer as long as they knew their IP address. Microsoft would quickly patch this issue and the program would no longer work. But if people could create hobbies or even entire careers out of exposing bad code in a piece of software, what was stopping him from being one of them? Sammy's new computing and online presence was dedicated to reverse engineering code and programming, from finding vulnerabilities in games like Counter-Strike to, well, releasing exploits to those vulnerabilities in Counter-Strike and having the actual game developers get involved. But now it's 2005. He's 19 years old, has dropped out of high school, and runs his own tech company that would be worth around $46 million, with nine years of programming experience under his belt. All his friends were now on this relatively new, insanely popular website called MySpace.com. Sammy had been reluctant on joining right away, but eventually all the peer pressure caught up to him. I mean, everyone else was doing it. So he went ahead and created his first MySpace account, and immediately did what he does best, search the site for exploits. Sammy felt that MySpace was, in some respects, a bit lackluster. Like the fact that you could only upload 12 photos? That's it? Well, he eventually figured out a workaround to this, on top of other things, such as being able to change his relationship status to say, in a hot relationship, an option that was not a part of MySpace's drop-down menu. These changes were initially very subtle, but as he continued exploring, he soon realized just how much control he truly had at his disposal. To get nothing more than a laugh out of his friends, Sammy decided to create a script, where anyone who visited his MySpace page would automatically add him as a friend, and then add text to their page which said, but most of all, Sammy is my hero. It was harmless, it didn't delete anything or obtain personal information, it just made a funny joke. But he decided to make it even more interesting than that. Now not only would anyone who visited Sammy's page add him as a friend, it would also add this script to their page. So anyone who visited that person's page would also add Sammy as their friend and have this script added to their profile, and so on. Sammy had just accidentally created a computer worm, and he thought that maybe a dozen people at the most would add him as a friend. But by the time he woke up, he now had over 10,000 new friends on his profile, all of them declaring him as their hero. He even received direct messages from people asking why he was on their profile. And thanks to the beauty of exponents, in just a couple of hours, this number would snowball to 50,000, 75,000. At the end of the day, Sammy's friend list was now at 1 million. Naturally, he starts to completely panic, though deleting the code from his profile doesn't prevent the other users from continuing to spread it. He tries to shut down his profile, but he can't even do that for another 24 hours. He decides to send an anonymous email to MySpace explaining how to remove the worm, but he never gets a response. But eventually, his profile would get taken down before the end of the day, but then so would all of MySpace. With nothing more than some pretty simplistic code, Sammy shut down an entire online ecosystem used by millions of people and corporations, and he had been a user for hardly one day. Just a couple of months before the Sammy virus entered the picture, MySpace had just been purchased by News Corp, a division of Fox, for $580 million. In other words, MySpace was not small potatoes, it was a very big deal. So how on earth did such a huge and obvious vulnerability go completely unnoticed all this time to the point where even a 19-year-old could exploit it? It's not like the Sammy worm was the first. Did the internet really not learn their lesson from the multiple devastating online attacks that had preceded it? Well, yes and no. The interesting thing about this vulnerability is that it was a byproduct of something that was actually considered a feature on MySpace, the ability to customize your profile using CSS. This was a bit of a common trend throughout the internet in the early 2000s, and as social media grew later on in the decade, its prevalence did as well. 
To a lesser extent, even the old YouTube channel layouts had a similar setup. This allowed people to create very customizable, unique pages, many of them terrible to look at. This was very common before smartphones became a thing. It could be argued that MySpace was the site that started this trend. But at the same time, MySpace was special. It was a social network akin to something like Facebook, but it was also more than that. MySpace was your entire personality on a web page. You could choose your profile's colors, change the background, you could even have music play on your page. It wasn't just a name and a profile picture. You could change your web page into any style that fit your mood. But not only that, on MySpace, you could customize things even further by writing your own code. You weren't confined to the digital walls that are seen in typical profile settings. You could do pretty much whatever you want. Many people actually learned HTML and CSS and became professional programmers because of MySpace, as they would spend all their time putting together a profile perfectly tailored to their desired online persona. So how does this all tie in to the Sammy Worm? Well, you probably know where this is going, but things do take a bit of a turn. I say you could do pretty much whatever you want because there were some limitations. Sammy executed the worm through something known as cross-site scripting. Not to be confused with the CSS we just talked about, the acronym for this term is XSS. Developers at MySpace were aware that giving users such flexibility would be abused in some way, shape, or form. So they went ahead and blocked things like JavaScript from being used within the CSS coding settings. But Sammy found a loophole. Rather than exploiting MySpace, he exploited his web browser. Browsers at the time were actually very lenient when it came to interpreting broken code. So if you wrote a JavaScript command with a few formatting issues here and there, the browser would still read it the way it was intended. This was done so that websites that may not have been coded properly could still load without issues. So for example, if Timmy sucks at writing HTML, he can still have his website show up on the internet. As long as the browser knows what he meant to write, it doesn't have to be perfect. So what Sammy did was he wrote his JavaScript code in a certain format that was intentionally slightly incorrect. This format would be too unique to be picked up by MySpace's filters, but coherent enough for a browser to understand the intent of what he was writing and therefore execute it anyway. Browsers like Firefox and Opera did not have this interpretation feature, but Microsoft's Internet Explorer and Apple's Safari did. This was the reason why many websites that would load properly in Internet Explorer and Safari did not load properly in Firefox and Opera. So naturally, Internet Explorer and Safari appeared smarter, and therefore gave Internet Explorer the majority browser market share. But when almost all the users on MySpace are using Internet Explorer, it's clear why events unfolded the way that they did. So it wasn't really MySpace's fault, it was the web browser. The only thing MySpace could do was now add this new style of formatting to this filter list, so it was ultimately the responsibility of web browsers to just, I don't know, read code the way it was supposed to be read? But even with putting all that aside, the reason the worm was able to exist also coincides with the attitudes of the internet that were present in 2005. In addition to mainstream websites giving users more customizability, people were still learning about the seemingly unlimited capabilities of computer viruses. And this even applies today. There are currently ways of hacking into entire corporations and causing destruction that haven't been discovered yet. Many people were hyper aware of the destructive worms made in the past, but it takes time for most people to collectively learn more about it. It is not something that happens overnight, but is instead gradual. After MySpace shut down to remove the worm, the site, of course, went back up and things went back to normal. In fact, so did Sammy's life. He never heard anything from MySpace or the authorities. No matter how much he looked over his shoulder, his life went on as usual. Until six months later, when the FBI showed up with search warrants in front of his brand new car at his apartment. They began searching through all his things and seized all his electronics. Sammy was now facing prison time. 
but eventually entered a plea agreement to pay $20,000, do 720 hours of community service, three years of probation, and could only use one computer that didn't have access to the internet. During that time, he just lived life, the kind of life that was typically enjoyed before computers were invented. And when his sentence was finally over, the first thing he did was buy a computer at the Apple store, went on the web for a few minutes, and then just turned it off and went to hang out with his friends. Sammy was quite the introvert whose main connection with people was through a computer screen, and although his sentence was hard at first, it gave him the opportunity to be more outgoing and meet some fascinating people in the real world. This worm taught Sammy to literally go outside and touch grass. CSS as an art form on social media sites eventually started to die out, and a big reason for this was, you guessed it, mobile devices. These types of web pages did not look nearly as glamorous on phones and tablets as much as they did on desktop and laptop computers, and as the market share of mobile devices grew over the years and demand for mobile-friendly sites entered the picture, CSS-styled web pages were less needed and ultimately fell out of fashion. It's easy to point fingers at the Sammy worm for causing this, but really, it was the smartphones. So what did the Sammy virus give us today? Well, for one, the entire ordeal taught its creator how to use hacking ethically. Rather than using exploits to cause havoc, intentional or not, instead he can find exploits and programs and showcase to the developers what could happen if they go unnoticed. Sammy's career is now dedicated to helping organizations find and patch vulnerabilities present within their software. In addition, he would also become one of the main whistleblowers behind exposing big tech for collecting and tracking their users' data. In 2010, he would create an API known as EverCookie, a cookie that is meant to be extremely difficult to delete. This was created to illustrate just how capable websites can be in collecting your data, even if you go out of your way to avoid it, posing a huge issue on the matter of privacy. The Sammy Worm also existed during a time when online security was lacking, not just on MySpace, but in general. Around 80 to 90% of sites at the time were vulnerable to some kind of cross-site scripting attack. 10 years later, that number had dropped to 47%. If the Sammy worm hadn't existed, who knows what this number would be at. So yes, the Sammy virus was a lot more than just some practical joke. It spread awareness about the vulnerabilities of many seemingly secure platforms, while indirectly pointing out the unethical practices of many large corporations. It serves as a cautionary tale for how anyone with just a computer and some code can impact the digital lives of millions of people, some of whom he'll meet, and those he'll never meet. There is no reason to feel insignificant. Everything you do has some kind of effect on the world. It is the strongest power that you have. So just remember to be careful with how you use it and make sure it's for the greater good because you might just accidentally shut down an entire website. Don't forget to download War Thunder using my link in the description to get access to some awesome content and plain fun. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and click the notification bell so that you never miss a future video.